Today on Monkey Life, Alison and the team welcome a new female loris to the park. She doesn't have a name right now, so just calling her her, and we're just going to have to try and think up a name and get to know her. There's also a tiny new addition at the Woolly Monkey House. This is baby number five for Zingu, um, and she's had yeah fantastic success with all babies. Um, so yeah, she's just taken it in her stride. And a log lifting workout for Dodger the Capuchin. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. I'm shocked. This animal is living in fear of its life at all times. The park provides a home for more than 260 primates from 25 different species. It's a big day for the park's group of lorises. Alison is awaiting the imminent arrival of a female from a private collection in Cornwall. I was approached to take on the loris to give her a better life and potentially companionship of her own kind. So that's all good. Um, I've allowed the loris to be delivered here, which is not usual. So um, any time this morning, she should be being delivered um, by one or two people. And hopefully I'll get a chance to speak to them a little bit more about her. So um, primate care staff are gonna, Steph and her team are gonna have a lot of work cut out for themselves just to make sure she's doing okay. Um, she doesn't have a name right now, so just calling her her and we're just gonna have to try and think up a name and get to know her. To make more room for the new female and the existing residents, three of the park's lorises have moved to a newly adapted nocturnal house. In the last few days, two of them, Boo and Bruce, have been getting reacquainted. They lived together a few years ago before being separated. The other female, Bobby, is in her own bedroom for now, while the primate care team carefully monitor Boo and Bruce to see how they get on. Elle feels the process is progressing well. This is like the most positive I've, I've seen Boo in an introduction. Also watching with interest is Dr. Marina Kenyon, director of Monkey World's sister sanctuary in Vietnam, who has experience of working with lorises. They've been so good together. He was so gentle this morning. And he's been so nice, he's grooming her. He's very steady, as it naturally would be in the wild when they come and meet and assess. So it's really lovely. It's all looking positive, which is just as well because the new addition has just arrived. Hiya. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. The unnamed Loris is thought to be around 12 to 13 years old. Hi, you missus. What's she like? Pretty laid back. She is a very laid back look, especially from what I've heard about your ones. They sound like they're a bit feisty at times, um, isn't it? Well, right. one of them I've named Axel Rose. Oh, lovely. Does yeah, that, yeah. Does that sum no. Up? no, he's full on. He's full on, and yes. he's a bit of a handful. Alison wants to take the new arrival to the original Loris house as quickly as possible. Unlike her new housemates, she won't have experienced reverse lighting conditions. Lorises are nocturnal, so she would normally be asleep now and awake at night. The park's special lighting means their lorises are the opposite, allowing the primate care team to feed and monitor them during the day. Steph puts the travel crate into the bedroom and opens it up. But the new female stays put. Lorises can be stubborn, so it's going to be a waiting game while she gets used to the sights and sounds of her new home. After a winter storm wrecked one of the enclosures at the domestic marmoset house, the team decided to seize the opportunity, not just to rebuild, but to redesign as well. With marmosets still arriving from the UK pet trade and more on the waiting list, every inch of space is vital. This new design is for two enclosures, which can and will mostly be used as one space. 
It's linked by a series of tunnels, making it easy to split if needed for a new arrival. Today, Ruby's family of six are going to give it a test run. It's pretty exciting. They have been trapped inside for a little bit because uh, there's been some damage to the enclosure. Um, and I can see they're already pretty excited to come outside as well. They're a lively bunch and appreciate all the space. They're quite chaotic. Um, Ruby is obviously the boss. She's quite easily the biggest and she will jump in front of the others and give a couple of tellings off. Uh, Oscar's very quiet, keeps to himself. Um, he's happy just mooching around doing his own thing. Uh, the kids are everywhere. Um, they're very hard to tell apart. <laughs> uh, they do look very similar at the moment, so trying to spot them and tell them apart can be quite tricky. They don't normally need much encouragement to explore, but just in case, Ali is putting out some of the family's favorite insects and grubs. My plan is to put wax worms, some of the insects that they really enjoy, mealworms as well, into these holes. Yeah, there's a few in there that will work. Um, and then they'll just come down, have a forage, uh, gives them an excuse to come into the enclosure so they're not too nervous and uh, it's something that they can benefit from. Go on, guys. The main tunnel to the enclosure is the same route the marmosets are used to, but there's an additional access point and everything else is completely new too. It stops dad Oscar in his tracks. Mum Ruby is less cautious and barrels past her mate to check things out. Their somewhat unlikely relationship has unexpectedly resulted in two sets of twins, Mary and Pippin, and their younger siblings, Bilbo and Frodo. Dad's still watchful and hanging back, but the kids are determined to investigate and are straight off exploring their new surroundings. Learning new access routes and how to get from A to B can be daunting. But the majority of this marmoset family take everything in their stride. Even Oscar has ventured further out, although he's still a little wary. One of the youngsters is already checking out the insect-filled log Keeper Ali prepared for them. I think it'll give them a good uh, week of trying to figure things out, uh, work out where things are, and then as soon as they've done that, we'll come in and change something, we'll add something different, and then they'll, they'll have to start all over again, which is part of the fun of doing this. <laughs> but for now, Ruby and her family are enjoying exploring their new two-in-one home. For the last few weeks, the primate care team have been excitedly anticipating the arrival of not one, but two woolly monkey babies. They suspected first-time mum-to-be Olivia would be first to give birth, but experienced parent Zingu beat her to it. This is baby number five for Zingu, um, and she's had yeah fantastic success with all babies. Um, so yeah, she's just taken it in her stride. She knows exactly what to do. Uh, it's only a few days in, so she's still taking lots of time to rest. You know, it obviously takes quite a lot out of her having a baby, but she's really just kind of pretty chilled out with it all, and yeah, baby's looking really good. It's the ideal scenario for the team. They're hoping super mum Zingu will show her five-year-old daughter Olivia the ropes. For Olivia, she has, this is the third baby that she's seen now with, with Zingu, so she's already sort of observed quite a lot of Zingu's mothering skills, but just the general care, cleaning up, checking around the back end and making sure everything's clean, um, encouraging the position for the suckling, so you can see that with Zingu sometimes, where she's kind of manoeuvring a little bit, making sure baby's going in the right place. Um, and yeah, also how she's interacting with the group, keeping out of the way of the big boys if they're charging around. Um, yeah, so we're hoping that she'll just pick up all of these little tips um, and that she will be nice and calm when, when the baby comes. The team are keeping Zingu and the baby indoors for the first few days to keep a close eye on them and check the infant is suckling well and passing urine and faeces. It's too early to be sure what sex the new arrival is. And there's also the matter of who's the dad. We've got a massive big question mark over who is the dad. Um, we've got three big boys in this group, 
Zingu is a particularly popular lady and she spends time with all three of those boys. Um, so I'm not sure it's going to be very easy to pinpoint. And um, we do record when we see any kind of interactions with Zingu or any of the other females with what males and what they're getting up to. But there's a, a great deal of time that we're not with these animals. Lavar himself is quite elusive, so you'd quite often find that he might choose to be with Zingu when we're not watching because he doesn't really like us to see what's going on with him. So it's, it's going to be very difficult to, for us to pinpoint on this occasion who, who is the dad. The team are just happy mum and baby are healthy and doing well. But there's no time to relax. The baby's half-sister Olivia is due any day. And the hope is that birth goes just as smoothly. Two of Monkey World's more recent arrivals have had a busy six months settling into life at the park. Patus monkey pairing, Mr. Patus and Penelope, were first housed alongside the Gwenons. Now they've moved across the park to a permanent home they can call their own, with a lot of noisy neighbours. Yeah, they're doing very well down here. They've got the capuchins opposite them, which uh, adds for a bit of entertainment. They vocally talk to the spider monkeys in the morning, they alarm call and have a bit of a chat. And also they really love sitting high up at the top end of the enclosures because they can see the stump tail macaques opposite them. Um, so they're getting on really well down here. It's a, it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more exciting than when they first came. The pair, rescued from a zoo in Wales, were extremely nervous when they first arrived. Since then, the primate care staff have, slowly but surely, built up a good relationship with them both. They actually wouldn't even make eye contact towards us. Um, we'd quite often find that when we went in the same house as them, they'd go off in the corner and hide. Um, so it's, it's been hard work to even get them to, you know, look at us, come towards us, let alone take food off us. So it's been quite the achievement. One of the most effective methods used by the team to build trust and establish a bond is operant conditioning. Hi, mister. Or clicker training, as it's also known. Hand. Good boy. It entails an animal being asked to do something in exchange for a reward. Good boy, Mr P. Hand. Good lad. Elle has been working with Mr P and Penelope for the last two months. This is something that's even took us a long time to get them to the position where they feel comfortable to, to come over, let alone take food reward. So at the minute I'm working with Penelope just taking food from me and not snatching it. Um, obviously that comes with time, comes with confidence. And Mr Patas, I'm trying to get him to stay in one station spot at one time. So I'll go over to her and I'll click on and I'll reward him for staying still. Most of the primates at the park have experience of operant conditioning. It builds confidence and trust with their carers, allowing the staff to get up close, vital for checking on health issues or giving medication. Good boy. Mr P is further along with his training than his partner. Hand. Good lad. He's a very clever animal, um, so just getting him to sit here almost doesn't feel like enough. He, he seems to get a little bit impatient and he wants to do more. Um, and also because he's now um, made the association between the clicker and he's getting more confident with his training, we can then start training other things such as presenting feet. We can start presenting open mouth so we can look inside its, uh, its teeth and other things like that. There's no doubt Mr P is the more confident of the two, but Penelope is beginning to come into her own. When she starts to get more confident, her personality starts to shine. So even though it seems she's very shy, she's not really. Um, she's actually quite the character, really. It's testament to the care and dedication of the primate care team for their charges. The two patas have come a long way in just six months, and everything is pointing towards a positive future. Across the park, there's been a bit of a falling out amongst one of the capuchin groups. Hello. Hi, come on here, Dodge. Life had been running smoothly for new arrival Dodger, but last week he had a major altercation with Gizmo and his five ladies. 
It's led to Dodger having to move house and join a different group. Dodger is a very energetic animal and he kind of seems to be getting quite frustrated up here and unfortunately taking it out on some of the other individuals in the group. And, you know, Gizmo does have a lot of social issues anyway and he's not really coping with that change too well either. The park's capuchin complex is home to three different groups as well as a trio of spider monkeys. Donna knows the dynamics well and, after a lot of thoughtful consideration, decided Winslow's group of 16 would be the best fit for Dodger. So we're leaving Dodger down to the Capuchin Complex in the hope that Winslow's troop don't have too many political things going on at the moment, so we're hopeful that Dodger might slip in there OK. Dodger is being given plenty of time to settle down and get used to his new surroundings, which are bigger and noisier than anything he's experienced previously. So far, he's taken everything in his stride and has met quite a few new housemates, including leader Winslow. Now he needs to meet the remaining members of the group and experience the outside area of his new home. We're going to let Dodger out into his new enclosure. Um, so it's much bigger than any enclosure that he's been in before. It also is open top, so it doesn't have a roof. So to you and I, that seems like not a big deal at all. But for him, he's always had something over his head. Whereas now this is really open. It's much higher than anything he's seen. And there's lots of other things going on as well. So really exciting for us. And hopefully it'll be exciting for Dodger as well. Donna is distributing a number of rotten logs to encourage him. They're full of grubs and insects, perfect for foraging. And he'll be joined by five other members of the troop to show him the ropes. Norman and uh, four other females who are all used to the enclosure, so they know their way around, they know where everything is that surrounds the enclosure. So that should help Dodger because they'll be really relaxed and they'll just crack on and hopefully he'll just follow their lead. Ready, Dodger? Donna opens up and a cautious Dodger heads outside. He has a good look around, taking it all in. But he's a confident male and soon sets off to explore. Five of his new housemates are outside, ready to keep him company. Fifi's already foraging through the log pile for grubs. Dodger joins in. Capuchins love insects, and the logs are the perfect encouragement to indulge in the natural behaviours innate to the species. Dodger's technique is a bit gung-ho. Donna's pleased to see him confidently going back and forth from outside to in on a number of occasions. He's not even concerned when a herd of deer appear alongside the enclosure. He's totally focused on foraging for insects. Even the noisy neighbours in Franco's group next door don't faze him. It was like he'd always been in there. Um, he loved it, he was using all of the areas. Um, there were some areas where he could see Franco's troop next door as well. So that was very exciting for everybody. Um, so this is another step forward. He can run around, burn off some of that energy and it should be really good for him. It's looking like a positive change for Dodger and a more natural life within Capuchin society. His next hurdle will be coming together with the entire group as one. And so far, the signs are positive. A few weeks ago, the park's maintenance team moved a large living ash tree into the Gwenon family's enclosure. They absolutely loved it. So much so, they ate all the new fresh buds and started stripping the bark. The primate care team have decided to step in to give the tree a chance to recover. They've opted for a distraction technique, distributing lots of newly pruned fruit and willow branches covered in buds and catkins around the enclosure. We've put out some um, pear and apple branches that have started budding. You can see all the little buds on here. And the Gwenols are going to absolutely love these. They're going to be really tasty. Uh, they've also got a bit of spring in the branches, so the kids are going to have a lot of fun bouncing around on these. Um, hopefully it'll keep them busy, because uh, they are so active and so energetic that we need to keep them as occupied as possible, otherwise they could get a little bit bored. Which is why we try and do stuff like this as much as possible. 
The team have piled the branches on the platforms, creating small thickets for the family of four to investigate and forage through. I'm very excited to see what they get up to with these uh, branches and uh, these buds that we've put in. I can guess that they're going to eat them and throw them around the enclosure, um, but it'll be interesting to see if they do anything new with them um, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Come on, guys. The family head out together and make straight for the browse. Parents Benny and Nia share a close bond despite their two hyperactive daughters taking up a lot of their time. But this morning, the sight of all the buds and flowers has captured their full attention. Mum, Dad and the youngsters are all tucking in. Gwenons are natural foragers and live in mangrove forests, travelling through the tree canopy. Fresh leaves and buds make up part of their diet, as well as fruit and insects. They have well-developed cheek pouches allowing them to forage across a wide area, before finding a safe place to chew and swallow their food. Their hands are similar to humans, meaning they can easily manipulate the buds from the branches. Sisters Nala and Biff soon discover the branches bend and move as they climb, Perfect for playtime. The girls don't give Dad Benny a moment's peace. But every now and then he puts them in their place. Benny uh, is, likes to keep himself to himself. He's, um, he's an older, older gent. He likes to sit by himself and often he'll groom with uh, Nia as well. Nia um, is always pretty focused on the girls. She always likes to know what they're up to, but they're at that age now where they can pretty much go off and do whatever they want. Um, that quite often involves charging around the enclosure with each other. They're very energetic. So um, the sooner we can give them a lot more space to, to use, the better. And that's going to happen soon. A dramatic change to the Gwenon's enclosure has been in the planning for some months. The scheme involves a roof, which will create a lot more height. Lots of shrubs and trees will be added and linked with hoses. It'll mean a better use of space for the high climbing Gwenons, giving them lots more room to move around. The changes will involve a few weeks of disruption, but the benefits will make it all worthwhile. Next time on Monkey Life. Alison travels north to collect a female marmoset whose owner has died, leaving her in the care of a neighbour. Wow, look at that breakfast tray. That's enough to feed an army of marmosets. Uh, it's the variety. <laughs> and Zingu's baby ventures outside for the first time. <laughs>